27. Hallelujah. It reads as follows. But be the doer of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not for forgetful, here you are, or hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. Anyone among you thinks he is religious and doers, not bridles his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. Pure are antifaults religion before God. And the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep one, oneself unspotted from the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. I greet my brothers and sisters in the name of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I can't hear myself on this. Thank you, Brother Ronewa, for a beautiful reading. And thank you, Brother Iglesias, for leading us in singing. The book of James is one of those beautiful books in the Bible. James, as the brother of the Lord, writes interesting stuff in the Bible. And you'll agree with me that James is, is challenging. He, he challenged us to, to work. You know, if you read, the entire book is about action. If it was the things of this world, I would say James is, is by my action. <laughs> he, he encouraged the church to, to do some work. And I've, I've, tit I've uh, titled this morning sermon, An undefiled religion, pure and undefiled religion. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this day that you have given unto us. This time as we we read from your word and we hear your sermon, we pray, Father, that you may encourage us, be with us. We pray, Father, that your word may not be broken, for your word is truth. We pray that whatever is taught, Father, we may put it in our hearts. And if the time is right, we also can share with others. Pray for myself as well as I present this lesson that you give me necessary courage and, and ability to do so. Thank you for Jesus who made all this possible. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. From if you read from verse one of verse 21 of James chapter 1. We, we hear that we have received the weight and we should receive it with meekness. And it reads as follows, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted weight, implanted weight which is able to save your souls. James is already telling us that the weight that we have received is able to save our souls. And if you read in the book of John chapter 17, when, when Jesus is praying to his disciples or his apostles, 
in verse 17, he tells, he says, sanctify them with your word, for your word is true. So we already get the truth that the word is able to save us. But we also get it from Jesus when he says, the word is the truth. But Timothy also, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul is writing to Timothy, he, he, he reminds him of, of the ability of, of the word. He says, the word is, is inspired by the Lord, is inspired by God, and is able to, to teach us, is able to correct us, is able also for reproof, and also for instruction in all righteousness, so that the, the, the man of God is thoroughly equipped for every good way. But it is in Psalms that we also read that the way is perfect in Psalms chapter 19, verse 7. And James, having, having read the word, is encouraging us that we need to be the doers of this word. In other words, James says, as, as good as this word is, as good as, as important as this word is, he says we need to be the doers of this way. He urged us to be the doers of this way. And he says whoever listens to this way and, and does not do what the word says is like a man who looks at a mirror and forgets what he looks like. He, he, he reminds me of what Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 21 verse 28 when he speaks about a, a, a two, two sons. He says this man had two sons and he asked one of them to go and work in the vineyards. And he said, you know, you know my father, I'm, I'm unable to go. He refused to go and, and work in the vineyards. And he, he asked another one, he said, my son, go and work in the vineyards. And, and the other one said, no, no, my, my, my father, I will go and work in the vineyards. And, and, and the other one, the first one who refused to go, the Bible says he changed his mind and went and worked in the vineyards. And the other one who did not accept to go and uh, the one who said he will go to work in the vineyards, he never went. And Jesus asked the, the, the Jews there, he said, who is better between the two? Who is better between the two? You see, in other ways, that the one who accepted to go and work didn't make any difference because he never went. But the one who went made, made an impact because he went and, and, and worked in the vineyards even though he, he firstly refused. In other words, Jesus cautioned the, the, the Jews there and, 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 and he said, you, you know the way, but you never did what the word says. And he says, the prostitutes and the taxpayers are overtaking you and they are entering the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, that the Jews were supposed to do what the word says. We too, even today, in order to achieve and all, get all the blessings, we should do what the word, the word says. Knowing the word will not help us to attain the salvation. Hearing the word will not help us to attain the salvation. But doing what the word says will help us attain the salvation. So James continues in chapter, in chapter 1, verse 25. He says, but he who looks in the, into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forget, forgetful here, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. James mentioned five things there in the scripture. Number one, he says, we must look into the scripture. We must look into the way. And number two, he says, we must continue with the way. And number three, he says, we must not forget what the word says. And he says, we must do what the word says. And number five, he says, if we do that, we are blessed. And in James chapter two, we will also hear that the faith that works is dead. Faith without works is dead. In other words, if we have faith, it will show in our works. It will show in what we do. 
And in chapter 27, where I need to focus this morning, he speaks about things that are pure and unantified. And he calls those things religion. Religion is a something that you continually do. Is a is something that you are so convicted to do. And he says something, two things that we need to do that are not stained as Christians. Number one, he says, is to visit the orphans and the widows. It is difficult to, to visit the orphans and the widows because most of the time they are in need and we're going to find out that they are in need and we have to provide for their needs. So it is difficult to visit the orphans and the widows. But James says this is an undefiled religion. Do it. Often we don't care about them because we never put them in that situation. Or we say, I'm not affected by their need. It is not my responsibility. We bury our head in the sand. Sometimes because we, uh, we, we pretend as if we don't see and we don't, we don't hear. But James says that is an undefiled religion to visit them and take care of their needs. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, that do not get weary, do good, and in due season you will reap the rewards. It's easy to speak about things that are undefined or they don't define us. But what defines us? What stains us? The things of this world stains us. You know, there are some ideas that we get from the world that stains us, that makes us unpure. In the book of 1 Corinthians, we see Paul putting the foreign teachings and the world introduced foreign teachings in many ways. In the first century they struggled with Gnosticism. To simplify it without going into the technicalities, Gnosticism was basically a knowledge, they were basically arguing that only knowledge leads to salvation. So Paul argues and, and refutes that that knowledge and he says to those that are perishing the, mer the message of the cross is foolishness but to us who believes is the power of God so in other ways the things that we hear in the world that often contradict salvation those things will not take us to salvation and people that come up with those things technicalities often uh, undermines salvation and Paul says and that will not bring to us salvation because it denies Christ it denies his birth it denies the prophecies it denies the work of salvation his deity and also him the, the Lord as an agent of creation also in Galatia there they, they was their teachings there that kept in, in the church because Paul went and, and taught them and they believed and, and suddenly they, 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 come up, they came up with law and arguing that in order for people to be believed, in order for people to be saved, they have to follow the law and particularly uh, circumcision. 
and Paul argues, and I, I, I like how, how he argues in the whole book of Galatia, Brother Kirit, because he, he doesn't mean his ways. That there's a time when he calls them foolish. <laughs> he calls them foolish Galatians. And, and there's a time when he also uh, got annoyed by Peter when Peter was in hypocrite. He exposed Peter because Peter was sitting with, 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 with non-Jews and, and he was having a meal with them, was eating with them. And, and when the Jews came, he, he ignored them. He pretended as if he was not eating with non-Jews. And, and Paul exposed, they exposed him and he told him that whatever you're doing is hypocrisy. And, and he continues to, to teach them there in, in Galatia and to rebuke them. And there's a time when he tells them that who, who, we will be with you, you foolish Galatians. And, and there's a time when he says, the, the, the way you accepted the gospel, you, you, you were so close to, to, to pluck off your eyes and give them to me. And there's a time as well when he tells them that you accepted me as, as if I'm an angel and as if I'm, I'm, I'm Jesus Christ as well. And he gives you through this, these false teachings because they were stealing the salvation of the Christians in, in Galatia. Lately, uh, Brother Baxter was not intending to speak about this. There's a brother who, who, who went to Atechville, to the congregation in Atechville, and he was asked to do a closing prayer. He, he stood up and said, my son and I have a strategy to attack the devil. I'll speak in, I'll, I'll pray in English, and my son will pray in Swahili. It's, it's normal in the church for two people to pray, right? So, but with him, they prayed simultaneously. Guess what the church did? What will he talk to? Keep quiet. Open the doors. No, the church prayed. They all prayed together. That's not what we do in the church. And these are some of the teachings that keeps in in the church. But the church is battling with the world. It's battling with the teachings that we get in the world. The social economic issues. The first thing that I want to discuss of those issues that the church is battling with is the gender, the idea that gender is subjective. We don't want to go there, right? It's a sensitive issue. The church has never been blackmailed like this, at least since I've known the church, like this period, when the church is asked not to go there. You see, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, and he, he tells him that I, I urge all men to pray, lifting holy hands, without wrath or without doubting. So the people of the world twisted the scripture. And they, they said, you know, men are, are the only gender. So women, you are the subjects. You stay at home. Men will go and work. And men say, yes, yes, this is it. They also twisted Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, when it says, husband is the head of the wife. And they said, you man, you are nothing. But women fought back and said, we too are better than men. And the wife said, yes, women are better than men. And these are the ideas that the church is struggling with. And they, 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 they twisted Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, when it says, 
There's no pigs, no Jews, no women in the domain, no slaves, no free in the Lord. The scripture basically says salvation is for all. Males, females, any gender, any nation, Greeks, Jews, slaves and the free. Salvation is for you. And while women were excited about that, I've seen a, a, a video recently. There's a guy who wants to prove that may, women are more responsible than men. And he, he wrote all things that women do before they sleep. And he wrote men, what men do before they sleep and what women do before they sleep. So, he covered the part of what men do before they sleep. And on what women do before they sleep, he wrote, they ensure that the doors, the doors are closed, they switch off the lights, and they pick up the toys on the floor. And on the side of men, what they do before they sleep, there was nothing. And while people were excited about women being better than men, they ignored 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, which says, women are supposed to keep silent in the church and they are not supposed to speak and they are supposed to be submissive in the church. And they, the world continued to get excited. And they came and say, gender is nothing. No males, no females. Choose whatever you want to be. And the church struggles with that. They even take it further and say, You can be homosexuals. And it's fine with them. They ignore Matthew chapter 7 when it's, they, they basically quote Matthew chapter 7 when, verse 1 when it says, Do not judge for you will, for you will be judged. Like maybe in the church. Do not judge. I can be a homosexual. Completely forgetting the context and the meaning of the scripture. They also read Psalm chapter 14 verse 3 when it says, they, are, they have all become corrupt. They have all become corrupt and there's no one who's doing good. No one. When people teach about homosexuality, they say, no, we are all corrupt. We are all sinners. No one is doing good. Not even one. So, you church, shush. They also forget Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, when the Lord says, Do not sleep with a man as if you are sleeping with a woman. And he says, Whoever does that must be stoned to death. The Lord was harsh eh? in the Old Testament. They also forget 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. When Paul reads all the sins there, and also the sin of homosexuality, First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine, he says, "Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers." No extensioners will inherit the kingdom of God. They say, speak about everything else except homosexuality. We have seen one of the presidents in Africa. He's been attacked for banning homosexuality in the country. He's now been 
threatened with the sanctions from the big world. What is the church doing about it? Jim says, and to keep uns oneself unspotted from the world, we too should, not, should keep ourselves unspotted from the world, should keep ourselves unstained by the ideas of the world. They often say, this thing is sophisticated and it's biological and no preachers won't understand it. But the preacher in me says, you know, sex before marriage is sophisticated and it's biological because one will have those edges but will not practice them. That's the preacher in me. So in other ways, Sex before marriage as well is a sacrifice. Just like whoever feels like this, a domination of sitting genes, that they should not practice them. It's a sensitive issue. And James says, pure and undefiled religion is to keep oneself unstained from the world including the teachings of the world. A certain teaching that also puts the church under pressure is that money is everything. I'm talking about sensitive issues this morning. <laughs> the church is also under pressure because we are told that economics is everything that you need in life. Yes, we need money. For us to be able to come here, it's money. To wake up, it's money. To prepare yourself to come here, it's money. Money is created by God. It's created by God for us to use it. Silver and gold belongs to God. The society says, that's all you need in this world. And without it, you are in trouble. While that is true, we also need to recognize that it is God who blesses us with money and the needs that we need in this life. We praise those that are rich in this world. We regard them as the only people in this world, just because they have money. Recently, there was a, a wedding there, and according to those who made calculations of that wedding celebration, the celebration cost over five million rents. And the guy was issuing out the bottles of whiskey like nothing, expensive bottles of whiskey. His tent, he had about four big tents, very big tents. Everyone was seated and they enjoyed and they said, and they had good time, the food, there was more than enough for everyone. Two weeks down the line, he was arrested by the cops. And it was found that the money that he was using, the actually the, he stole from Esco. And I was thinking, he's one of those that are responsible that we are in lost shedding. And we were praising him and said, this man is rich. And he's responsible, he's one of those that are responsible for lost shedding. The church is under pressure with this economics because Talented people, they don't want to preach the way. They don't want to become preachers. Because there's no money in preaching. Young men, they don't get wives.
because women, young women say you can't be married to preachers because preachers don't earn much. Amen. They will not buy me a five million pounds <laughs> in the coast. So it is, it's disadvantaging the church. Why am I speaking about sensitive issues this morning? You may ask. <laughs> we need to be unspotted and we need to be unstained with the teachings of this world, from the teachings of this world. Why? It's important to, to have money. While it's necessary to have money, especially when you work for it, you have to enjoy it. You also need to recognize that it's not the only thing in this world. In fact, salvation is worth more than money. Jesus said, save your your treasures in heaven where no one will come and steal and where no moth will come and destroy. But money can be destroyed and can be stolen and can be lost. It can be a motivation to go on in this world, but should not be a motivation to be a Christian or to save the Lord. We might be millionaires, but still lose salvation. But we can be poor and still be saved. Salvation is more worthy than money. I've stressed the church enough this morning. <laughs> Let me conclude. <laughs> Let us respect the word of God and avoid the controversies that contaminate our faith. Let us stay uncorruptible and let us do what the Word says. Amen. Amen.